Good morning, Southside. It is good to be back. My name is Ken Murphy. Nice to meet you. <laughs> this morning, we're going to take back up in Romans where I left you hanging with one of the greatest promises in all of the Bible, Romans chapter 8, 28. Some call that the unpardonable sin to walk away before you preach that. <clears throat> There's something so rich in this verse that I want to I want it to have its full intended impact upon us as God has desired. This is no small promise that we look at this morning. My mind still can't quite comprehend and get over it. I don't want this truth to sit lightly on our hearts, and I don't want us to live lives filled with angst and anxiety and fear with a bedrock promise like this one from our God. This, this verse is true freedom. And so I don't want anyone in this church to know this verse only academically. I want it to permeate the whole of our lives and our thinking. And in this verse, we live, move, and exist and have our being. The Spirit opens the eyes of our hearts this morning to what this verse is saying. The ramifications are absolutely endless. I've been asking God to do just that, to marry what we know about this verse with the amazing rest and trust that God desires for His children of, of Abba, Father. And so may we mind the gold that is before us this morning. Let's go before our God and ask him to bless us. Father, we come before you, and I do thank you that you're working for our good. And I pray this morning, God, as we open up what that means, that you would let every heart in this room desire that good more than their own comfort, more than their own plans, more than their own hopes, more than their own desires. God, let this be the chief end of every heart in here. We want the good. We want the good of being conformed to Jesus Christ. And so, God, that is the best good. That is the ultimate good. And so I pray, make us alive to this. Make us alive to desiring conformity to Jesus Christ over a world that's passing away. And so, Lord, I pray that you would take this word this morning, unfold its beauty and its truth by your Spirit, and let every life put their head on this pillow for the rest of their days while they journey to glory. So we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans chapter 8. Oh, what a chapter. Chapter 8 is bookend in these two thoughts. In verse 1, there's no condemnation right now for those who are in Christ Jesus. It closes that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And that has to be grasped. The, the believer has to, to get this, as Paul would say, epinosis. We need to understand it. This is what the gospel does. It must be believed and trusted and rested upon. We need to live upon the promise this morning with absolute certainty. We have seen that Paul is telling us the grace of God will guarantee that we will make it to glory. And what is laid up for us is absolutely amazing. He said, we inherit God. We inherit Christ. Such an inheritance. But this isn't Pollyanna theology on the way to glory. It's Pollyanna theology. And this journey to glory. Paul say, your journey is going to be full of suffering. There'll be trials and groaning. Groaning bodies and a groaning creation. Futility. There will be battles on your way to glory. And the message is that all of this suffering on the way to glory cannot be compared with what's on the other end of it. You'll never suffer under this cursed world and body. You will suffer under this cursed world and body that you have. And I just want you to hear this. Denver will never be paradise. And if any of you are like me, I keep trying to make it. I try to fix all of my problems and pray away my afflictions and plan so not to have to worry, and then I can finally rest. Paul is saying, uh-uh. You can make the snowman on the 100-degree day. God makes the snowman, and it's called Christ-likeness. And we'll see this morning that all that we face on our way to glory, all of the suffering and discouragements and afflictions, God is taking them, and he's working them for our good. And that is how we will get to glory, God's purpose. There's no other uh, purpose on earth that can thwart God's purpose to bring us to glory. And so I want to unpack Romans 8, 28 this morning 
And, and may this uh, do more than we can ask or think in our own hearts. And so I want to pray again, but first I, I want to read this quote that I read the last time I preached this by Pastor John Piper. He said, if you live inside this massive promise of Romans 8.28... Your life is more solid and stable than Mount Everest. Nothing can blow you over when you're inside the walls of Romans 8.28. Outside of Romans 8.28, all is confusion, anxiety, fear, and uncertainty. Outside this promise of all-encompassing future grace, there are straw houses of drugs and alcohol and numbing TV and a dozen of futile diversions. There are slat walls and tin roofs of fragile investment strategies and fleeting insurance coverages and trivial retirement plans. There are cardboard fortifications of deadbolt locks and alarm systems and anti-ballistic missiles. Outside are a thousand substitutes for Romans 8.28. But once you walk through the door of love into this massive, unshakable structure of Romans 8.28, everything changes. There comes into your life stability and depth and freedom. You simply can't be blown over anymore. The confidence that a sovereign God governs for your good, all the pain and all the pleasure that you will ever experience is an incomparable refuge and security and hope and power in your life. Father, I pray that for every soul here this morning. We step into Romans 8.28. And we quit looking to all the lies outside of it that promise security and stability and hope and help. God, I want this. I want you. And I want you working for my good. Taking every detail of my life and shaping and forming me to the image of Christ. I pray, God, let every heart in here throw down lesser things. And and enjoy the depth and the fullness of this promise that you have given to us in Christ Jesus. And it's in his precious name that we do pray. Amen. Your outline this morning, Paul's going to give us three truths then to strengthen us in how God works in our trials on our way to glory. First, the certainty of how he works, then the extent, and then who are the recipients that God will work for your good. So look with me in verse 28 where we left off. I still, I feel shame that I left you hanging in verse 28, but here we go. Verse 28, and this conjunction links the whole chapter together in its flow. Paul is showing us that we have some enemies that are going to come against us as believers who are born from above. We are are not taken into heaven immediately. We'll not ride to glory on calm seas. There are some hard waters to navigate on your way to glory. Amen? Am I talking to the right crowd? So this and just blasts away this thought that life is going to be easier for the believer. Just lose that thinking. I come to Jesus so my life will be easier. Paul's saying in this verse, in this chapter, no. This is not a verse that promises in every cloud there is really a silver lining. You just have to find it. That's garbage. There's something better down the road. I hear this girl broke up with me and now the most amazing one is just around the corner. That may not be true at all. Because some of you are facing such hard things this morning, there is no silver lining. No matter what angle you look at it from, you can't find it. The promise here is bigger and more glorious than that. The and tells us that no matter how bad the stuff is within, my flesh, my sin, my lust, the battles that I have, no matter how bad the stuff is from outside, sword, peril, persecution, Romans 8, groaning with futility. The end tells us that none of these things can bring us back under God's condemnation. Nothing can bring me back under condemnation. And you need to get that. That's this whole chapter. These things can't bring you back under your own sin, can't bring you back under God's condemnation. In the midst of all these things that God's love and purpose for your life is right on track and it's not been thwarted. It cannot separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Must get that. There are going to be times when you don't even know how to pray. The last time we were together in verses 26 and 27, the Spirit will intercede and He will pray the will of God for your life, which is what Paul unfolded the last time we were together. 
But the Spirit will always pray for God to work everything for your good. It will always be effectual. He will always be working to conform you to Christ in whatever you're facing this morning. And the Spirit's interceding at the th- in your heart. God's hearing it, and they're working for your good. And so your prayers are not even the foundation of this verse happening, but the Spirit and the Son who's interceding from heaven on your behalf as well. We have heaven and our own hearts, the Son and the Spirit, all making sure that this promise comes to pass with a Father saying, I will cause it all to happen. I love it. God has surrounded this verse with every encouragement possible. Why do you think he did that? (laughs) Because we're so prone to not believe it. I've never, since I've been alive, I haven't seen more grumbling, discontentment, struggling. We're so prone not to believe Romans 8, 28. And this morning, I just want you to know I love the word and. Isn't that beautiful? It just ties in all of our life. So let's look at our outline. Our first point then is the certainty of our confidence. If you see in verse 28, and what? And we know. We know Paul is saying we, we are to have an absolute confidence in this truth. You can't kind of think maybe he will. It doesn't even say we deduce it or we're persuaded, but th- this is the end of working through all the doctrine that we've been studying in Romans and all that we've looked at, and we come now understanding the gospel and where we stand now, who God is, and we say, we know, we know. And I want you to just catch, it does not say, and we feel. At times, you're going to feel the exact opposite. We'll feel like we are being destroyed. The the pain is going to kill us. We'll feel like God just wants us beat down. And everything that we want or desire, he'll just withhold it from us. And deep down, it feels like God wants me to be miserable and just limp my way to heaven. Show of hands. (laughs) Think of Jacob when he thought Joseph was dead and now they wanted Benjamin And he cried out, all these things are against me. I call that the battle cry of unbelief. He didn't feel that all things were working working together for his good. Yet God was doing something for Jacob's good that he could have never imagined. He's going to preserve Israel alive through the famine. What uh, Sean read in Genesis, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. There'll be times when we might not see or perceive how God is bringing about the good. For some, it may not be until glory. And you stand on Mount Everest and look at your life with God's eyes. But at this time, we have to rest on the bare promises and the character of God. The faithfulness of God. And our text just simply says to the children of God, we know. We know. And I love the one who penned this. The one who was persecuted and shipwrecked and stoned and beaten and slandered and thrown into prison without food. He'd begin churches and heretics would come and spread strife in every church he planted. That's the one who says, and we know. And we know. I pray we would resolve this in our heart. Because the enemy is going to put this to test. He's going to say, God doesn't care that you're lonely or sick. Only the big things that he works for good. He's just going to come and lie. All hell will be thrown against this truth because this is the bedrock of the Christian life and how it's worked out. This verse is a foundation stone to our testimony to the world that we trust God in every high and stormy gale. We are an alien, set-apart people who are trusting every detail of our lives that God is working. And you're going to stand out in this environment more than you ever have if you'll be these kind of people. I just think of the whole last couple of years, what we have seen, and someone who can trust God with every detail of what's gone on, that he's working it to conform me to the image of Christ. Oh, the beauty of how that's going to look in a dark and dying world. John Newton put it so well, everything that is necessary, he sends, and nothing can be necessary that he withholds. Nothing can be necessary that he withholds from your life. We know it. Jonathan Edwards said, if you understand this, you may be able to look down on the whole army of worldly afflictions under your feet 
and you may consider with joy however so great they are and however so numerous they are. Let them all join their forces together, all of Romans 8, against you and put on their most ruthful and dreadful habits, forms and appearances, and let them spread of their strength, all their vigor, all their violence, and endeavor to do you any real hurt or mischief, and it will be in vain. Nothing can destroy you. You're indestructible in the will of God. And so I want you to see then there uh, the certainty that, that and we know. And now our second point, what is it we know? What is the extent of our confidence? And the extent of our confidence is that God causes all things to work together for good. And I just want to start with that first word, God, the sovereign one the unrivaled one, the one that all things bow to. And so I love this because all things are objects and circumstances and evil and demons. And, and th- th- this, these things, I just want you to catch this, will not work out. It just, Pollyanna theology won't worry. Everything's just going to work out. It won't. Bad things are bad. It is God who is the loving actor and author of taking all of these things, and he's the one that works them together for good. They will, it'll never come about unless God does that. Abba, my father, the, fulfill, the fulfillment of Abba is work all things for my good, daddy, I need you. The one that we stand in grace with in his favor all over us, encompassing, uh, encompassing us, God, father, Abba, works all things together. All things. This is dealing with the will of God. I want you to hear this. All things is our lives. It's this little Greek word, panta, and there's nothing outside of it. It means all things. Nothing can sneak into our life that will be outside the boundaries of this verse. (laughs) Everything, it's limitless. There's no restrictions or conditions except you be a Christian. Thomas Watson said, this is children's bread. Our whole lives fit into one Greek word and everything, all things fit into it and God will take all things, everything. You're sitting here bitter, broken, whatever it is, he will take all things and work them. And as you sit here in so much pain within and without, there is nothing that you are facing this morning that is not in this word, panta. All things. So everything. I just want you to get that. Whatever it is. All things. And all things work together. And the first thing that hit me about this verb is it's a present active indicative, which, which well, all I want you to get is it's not future. Because I, I know he's going to work all things for good in the future, maybe. And this morning he's saying, Present. Every day, God is working all things for your good. Right now, as you're sitting here in the middle of it and you can't see it, God is working for your good. It's a present tense. Every day of your lives, he's doing this. It's a beautiful word. The Greek word is synergeo, where we get the word synergism. (laughs) Webster says a synergism is a joint action of discrete agencies in which the total effect is greater than the sum of their effects when acting independently. So God takes all things, these things that are bad and hard and difficult and sometimes even good, and he'll take them and he'll use them. And this morning I was reading about table salt. My wife pulled it up on her phone. Thank you, Laura. That's a helpmate right there. And table salt is made up of sodium and chlorine, and they're both dangerous. They're they're both poisons. And so here are the bad things. And God says, I will synergeo them to make them work together to make French fries amazing. (laughs) And steak. All you vegetarians, it'll make steak taste so good. Um, It's great on vegetables too. It can synergeo vegetables. And so God can take all these hard, difficult, painful things of your life, and he can work them together for your good. And that is what God does. He takes events inside and outside, and he works them for our good. And so I just want you to hear that not all events are necessarily good, only their effect under the hand of God, causing them for your good. And so some of you have 
heard in my journey. It's hard. Someone shared I was molested by my father growing up. My dad died when I was 10. My spouse walked away, and the effect that it had on my children was unbelievable. I'm unequally yoked. Met with a man this week. His son died from alcohol poisoning in college. His daughter took her life. His wife then took her life. And his other daughter tried, and they, they saved her when, from it. And he sat there worshiping with me at the Black Eyed Pea. Some of you are facing some hard things. Your dreams have been smashed. An 11th brain surgery for the whole reconstruction of your head. Cancers, disease, death of spouse, parents. These things are not good. But our sovereign God, sinner get owes them for our good. And he takes every one of these things and he works them for good. And I just see this on a daily basis. I'm watching him change and transform you from one image of glory to the next. That's my greatest joy as a pastor, what he's doing in your lives. And it's through these hard things and he's sinner get owing them in every one of your lives. That's the promise that he's making here. The vastness of this promise is unbelievable. And what I want to talk about now is it's for good. He sinner ghettos everything in our lives for good. And this is the key to this verse. This has been butchered throughout the centuries. It's, it's, many times it's our circumstances. He'll make them better. He'll work them for good. There will be a silver lining. And in a month, in a year, in a decade, we'll see what it was. And that's what we think this means. But the promise is that the totality of your life, he's working for your good. He's moving you towards something. And what is that good? And this is what you have to get this morning, or this verse will do you no good. And look with me, it says, for those who are called according to his purpose. In verse 29, he says, those who are predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. And verse 30 talks about the whole work of God in our lives, starting in predestination, ending up in glorification. So God is working all things for our good to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. And, and the ultimate conformity when we breathe our last, when we are perfectly conformed to Christ. So you've got to put this promise in context. What God is promising to do to every child of God is I'm going to use every circumstance of your life to sinner ghetto, to conform you to the image of Christ. Everything in your life from the beginning to the end, I'm going to bring in to conform you to look like Jesus Christ. That is an unbelievable promise. Nothing can thwart it. And so again, his promise is not to make Denver paradise, but to bring you safely to paradise. And so I consider that these present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed to us and in us. So here's the key, to rise up and say, this isn't fair. So rise up against infinite love, perfect goodness, infinite wisdom, fashioning our lives in such a way to bring about our reflection of Jesus Christ. Everything God is working for this end in your life. Boom. I'm an accountant, so I can't, I'm not very creative in case you haven't figured that out. Um, I like this illustration of a, a sculpture. And there was this guy who's, he's working with marble and he's chiseling away. And the man walks up and says, what are you doing? And he just said, everything that doesn't look like Jesus Christ, I'm going to chisel away. And, and so God is here chiseling away and working all things to conform us to Christ. And sometimes he takes big chunks off and sometimes it's just a little filing. But I just want you to see that everything in your life is God chiseling away everything that doesn't look like Jesus Christ. That's what he's going to do in your life. Do you despise that? Embrace such goodness. 
Lay your head down on this kind of a promise from God. God will do this right now by faith. Do you believe this? Quit trying to rest in you working everything for your good. Melanchthon in the, in the Reformation, Luther would say, Philip, cease to be God. It's my message this morning. Cease to be God. Let him be God. Put your trust and rest in this glorious promise. God's working for your good. And just to be real, this is a promise that life will be hard and even harder as a believer. All hell is going to be thrown against you now as a child of God. But God will take everything, and I mean everything, shocking, shattering things, and he will work it for your good to conform you to the image of Christ and prepare you for glory, which is the end of this promise. By faith, will you crawl under this great promise from God? And we know. We know what the promise is and what it's not and live in it the rest of our days here on this earth until it climaxes in our eternal good when he's seen, realized, and enjoyed and will never be threatened again. And so this is what I see him doing in so many lives. I love a front row seat of sinner ghetto in all of your lives. And it, I, I weep with those who weep, but he's doing it. I, I just, again and again, in each one of your lives, I'm watching this. Thank you, God. Thank you. Third point certainty, the extent of it, and then the recipients of such confidence. He says in Romans 8, 28, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according <coughs> to his purpose. And so not everyone gets this. If you're here this morning, and you're not a believer. God is not working for your good. And so I, I, I want you to come under this massive promise this morning but the way you get there is through the cross of Jesus Christ who died on a cross for your sin and he offers a, a forgiveness for all your sin by the work of Jesus Christ. And as we come in through that, now he's your Abba, your Father, and he will work all things for good. And you'll never be able to work your life out. You're, you're probably here this morning because you can't work it out. And I want to offer to you this glorious promise, but it comes through Christ crucified. So who's this promise for? To those who love God. In the literal Greek, it says, and we know that to the ones loving God, all things work together for good. Romans 8 has been the dividing line between mankind. He, he says there's those who love God and those who hate God. Romans 8, 7, the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. It can't subject itself to the law of God. It's not even able to do so. You're, you're at enmity with God when you come into this world. He's your enemy. You're his enemy. There's a, there's a war going on between you. And so this promise is for those that that enmity has been removed and taken away. And now God loves you. You love God. And there's, there's a marriage. There's a family. There's adoption. I love this gospel. Romans 1, 7, Paul says, I write to you who are beloved of God in Rome. You are loved by God. Romans 3 through 5, the love of God is that his son came into this world while you were yet sinners and died for you. Romans 5, 5, now the love of God is shed abroad in your hearts. He's come and he's shown you and broken in to your heart that God loves you. And now I love God. Romans 8, 4, I can keep the requirement of the law and the highest requirement of the law is to love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is for the one who loves God. God, the test, not for what he gives me, but just for who he is. And so I ask often, do you love the giver more than you love his gifts? That has to be answered. And right now on this hallowed ground, I want you to answer it. Is this just a verse that has never made it into your heart to set you free as a child of God? Stare at the cross. And see that if God did the hardest thing by, by punishing his own son in our place, how much more will he take care of you day to day and work in your lives for good? You can never put your head down on Romans 8.28 unless you know that he loves you and that he has produced a love for him in your heart. The pillow will keep falling on the ground if you don't love him. And to those who are called, and we're going to be looking at that in the weeks ahead, 
But uh, essentially, it's the call. When God said, Lazarus, come forth, he gave him life so he could respond to the call. This is what's known as the effectual call of God. And so he called you from death to life. He called you from what we saw in Romans 1 through 3, dead sinners running away from God, none seek him, none desire him. And he called you into life. One preacher said, by bringing them into contact with the gospel, and making their dead hearts alive so they hear and see the gospel as irresistibly true and beautiful and respond in faith and repentance to those ones who have been called and who love God are the ones who he will work all things together for your good. Amen? I got, I'd let you go, but I got 10 points of application. Let's do it. Let's do it. I've been praying. I pray that God would work in each one of our hearts right now with this truth. And the first application is I want you just to lay down on this bed of roses. This is the sweetest promise I know as a battered Christian. Why, why would you this morning lay down on it and rest? It must move from your head to your heart that I, I can rest in this promise. I don't have to be just wrung so tight and anxious and worried. And I, I can, by faith, lay down this morning on this pillow. The freedom to know that, again, it's not you working everything for your good. I see some people, every day you feel like it's up to you to work everything for your good. And you walk around with the burdens of God on your shoulders. What, what a weight that belongs to Abba. You're not fit for it. Did you know that? You're not fit to be God. <laughs> You're always trying to work everything, your, the stock market, your job, your kids, whatever it is. I was reading on, on when I was away the last couple of weeks, um, my brother John had a book he was reading, and it, it just talked about the idol of control. And as I was reading it, that, that's really what we're looking at here this morning is I, I just want to control. I want to be in control. And I want to control my trials. I want to say when they're over. I want to control how I get out of it. I, I, I'm just, even in trials, I still try to stay in control. My finances, I just, I, I'm the smartest guy ever and I can invest. I'm just always, and I'm just, I just am always working to control everything. I, I just got to control people. I control my kids. I control my wife. I control, I, all I do is control people. And I'm always trying to control the future. Just oh, if I do this, if I, if I get a, you know, insurance, everything I can do, I'm just, all I can think about is controlling my future. I want to control my kids. I'm going to keep squeezing them and squeeze. All, your whole life is just control. It's an idol. What's the cure? We know that God causes all things to work together for good. You have someone better than you controlling your life. If you want to surrender your idol, just smash it. Throw it down. God, I'm sick of controlling everybody and everything and myself. I stink at it. And I'm anxious and I'm a mess and I'm crazy. Smash it. God is saying, I don't, you don't have to. I'll control your whole life. And I will sinner get oh, everything that comes into it to conform you to the image of Christ. That's freedom. God's offering you this morning. Come into freedom. America is a country that wants to control everything. And we've been out of control for two years and no one can handle it. They're just walking around mad, angry, and upset because we want to be in control and God's saying, you're not. Are you upset? I, 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 he's in control, okay? If we're a socialistic country one day, my God is my king. And that's not a hint of where I think things are going. <laughs> <coughs> Are your prayers just informing God how to run the universe? Your whole life is you working for your good. Would you hear the whisper of the Spirit of God this morning and the cry of Christ? Lie down on this pillow. Come. Find rest for your souls. Second, and I've said this so often, but your life is not plan B. There is only a plan A for your life. And you know what it is? I got good news for you. Plan A is conformity to Jesus Christ. So as you sit here this morning, you didn't ruin your life and throw yourself into plan B or plan C. Plan A, you can't get off of. 
as a believer. Plan A, God is conforming you by your bad decisions, your good decisions, your sins, your trials, the things that happened in your upbringing. I want you to hear wherever you're, whatever it is, God, you are on plan A this morning. And that plan is to make you like Jesus Christ. Isn't that good news? Third is to trust. My life is not what I wanted. It's not even a glimmer. I have a fear of being nominal. I have a fear of doing a life of what I hate doing. Everything's bad under the sun. Step into the fullness of this promise. It is not my life stinks. My life is being conformed by a perfect God who's working it to conform me to Christ. Plan A. I want you to trust what he's doing in your life. Quit resisting him chiseling chunks and taking them off to make you like Christ. Fourth, our current culture forced mandates with vaccinations and all that's going on and some of you have your jobs being threatened and there's a lot happening. And I just want you to lift your eyes no matter what it is. Your job isn't your provider. Your God is. And I want you to just put your head on this pillow and, and you with your own conscience, you do what is right before God and then we trust Him. And so with all the squeezings and all that's going on, there's, it's going to increase and there's going to become more and more and are we going to be the anxious ones and scared ones? Or are we going to be those that put our head on this pillow and just say, God, you're going to shape me into the image of Christ with how hard this is getting? Fifthly, this is the cure for bitterness. Bitterness is God's got it wrong, right? So this is the, the absolute cure for bitterness. God's working in my life. And I, I, I am exactly where he wants me. It's the cure for anxiety. I don't have to worry about tomorrow. I don't have to worry about today. I have a God who's my father. Working everything for my good. I'm so safe. Philippians 1.6 He who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. This is your future. He's going to complete it. And what, that, what is that completion going to look like? Christ-likeness. And so I just want you to love where your life's going to end. You're going to look like Jesus Christ. You're going to reflect him for, for all of eternity. And so love where he's moving your life. Love that more than everything I want today and getting my own way and my own plans. And love where he's going to take this. And so just be free. God's going to finish what he started. And it's going to be conformity to Jesus Christ. I want you to rest in that. So in these hard days in our land, I invite you to enter into this promise. So many walking around in fear and anger, undone, hopeless, numb, when God offers this to us. Go show forth a steadfast hope and trust in God until people ask you, what is the hope within you? People are hungering for a true hope. And I just, if anyone in here needs hope, I hold out Jesus Christ to you. He is the, the hope of all that I've just talked about. And so if you would like to surrender your life to him, believe in him, come forward. I'll be here afterwards and I would love to talk with you. So any questions? Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for this gem. Lord, I don't want to just understand this verse with my head. Lord, I want to enter into the fullness of it. I want to live by faith daily in this promise. I want to just be one who is so full of trust and love for you, trusting everything you're doing, the unfolding of your will, every providence you choose for me, every trial, every sinner ghetto that you're doing in my life. God, I pray, let us be trusters. Let us be people who love our God, love a father like that, who, who wouldn't love a father who works everything for your good to conform you to his son. God, thank you that we would get it wrong every time.
if we were in charge of our lives. So thank you that you don't even listen to our wrong prayers. God, thank you that you are bringing hardships and afflictions and trials where we can't breathe and we can't, we can't even make it unless you hold us and change us and uh, chisel off things that don't look like Jesus Christ by the furnace. And so, God, I thank you that every person who's a, who loves you and has been called according to your purpose this morning can trust their life with the very specific details of what they face this morning to a God who loves them and is working for their good. And I just praise you for this glorious truth. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.